Hello. Welcome to News Roast. News Roast. I'm Hayden and this is Jolyon. I'm Jolyon Rubenstein, yeah. And today... Oh my God. We have a quantum event taking place. It is a quantum event let today. Me, let, me, let me explain a little bit how okay. it feels when you hear that your best mate, you make loads of shows with, is oh. hanging out with someone else called Jolyon. Well, how did it feel? It felt pretty... <laughs> I, first of all, I thought it was a joke. Right. I was really doing all the sort of internet stalking I could. Yeah. And, you know, I realized that the last password I had for your yeah. email was at least like two months out of date. Yeah. So I started tracking your phone. And you see, the thing is, the thing is, Julian, I'd love to say, you know, you've nothing to worry about. And know. he's nobody. I know, and he means nothing to me. But he's actually a better Jollyan than you are. Well, that is... <laughs> That is a really <laughs> cruel and horrible thing to say. And one day I hope to meet another. If there's anyone called Hayden out there who does something amazing. Only let me just clarify. I'm sure this Jollyon isn't perhaps as good as doing uh, doing comedy characters Thank in the God. real world. Thank God. But he is a uh, incredibly impressive QC, no Absolute doubt. bad boy, lawyer, activist lawyer. Jolyon Morm. Yes. Who has recently... Um, taken a bit of a backseat from being uh, a QC in order to be a bit more radical and we're going to talk about a lot of the things that he's been doing but he's basically been bringing the government and major corporations to task and if you want anyone on your side as someone that campaigns for I don't know social justice things like that you want a guy like this so welcome to the podcast Jolian my sworn enemy Mom, how are you I'm very well thank you and what a wonderful introduction <laughs> Well, we are we are over the moon. Well, to have I was you thinking, on. Jolyon, when when we uh, leave the EU and it's like a Mad Max dystopian future, you could be our warlord leader. And I know <laughs> I know you've got you've got a training in law, not so much Mortal Kombat, but I was thinking transferable skills. Are there any? There are always these figures, aren't there? Um, wizened old men sitting at the top of the, be one the of those, pile those guys, in, in, yeah. in these dystopian worlds. Yeah. Yoda or... Right. Does, anyway. It could be like a druid. Yeah. <laughs> He's a bit too sort of strong and, and, and muscly and sort of, you know, he looks like he, he walks up mountains for yeah. a sort of druid. But let's mm. talk about how you became an activist QC. Um. It was by default, really. So I was muddling along, um, arguing tax cases, and I was just quite bored. And um, this was in about 2011, 2012, when we were all completely obsessed with tax avoidance. And I just thought, actually, I'm not sure my life is made for arguing tax cases forever. So I started to write a blog, and because I knew um, where the bodies were buried and was prepared to dig them up for the media and um, could write a little, that blog got quite a lot of attention amongst the people who mattered in that world. So I began to advise the Labour Party. I made friends with the Conservative tax minister back then, uh, David Gort, now the Lord Chancellor. And I was invited to deliver all sorts of sort of keynote addresses in that field. And I ended up advising the Labour Party. Indeed, I initiated, um, sold to them, devised, and then sold to the media the Labour Party's sort of key tax policy in 2015 election, which was the attack on non-DOM taxation. Wow. Mm. And that all happened very, very quickly but it was much more engaging than the work that I'd been doing. And so I wanted to do um, more of it. Can you tell people the name of your blog? So the blog is waitingfortax.com. Can I ask you, before we get into it, because I think you and Hayden met uh, when Hayden made his fantastic Tax Town uh, film, which we'll talk about in a moment. But does it frustrate you? Because obviously we did a lot in the revolution where we televised on Vodafone's tax avoidance, Topshop, Google... There doesn't really seem to have been, even though there was a huge amount of noise, that much fundamental change in the fact that corporations can still move to sort of low taxation areas. Yeah, so there are problems that we can help um, and there are problems that we can't help or at least that are much more difficult to solve. Um, the problems that are difficult to solve are problems that require multilateral action and I know we're going to come on to talk about all the stuff I'm doing in the Brexit field, but one of the principal frustrations for me is that in a world of kind of incredibly powerful capital, globalised capital, 
the power of individual nation states to combat abuses by that capital is very, very modest. The only way in which nation states can combat the likes of Facebook or Google, these enormously wealthy, powerful global corporations, is by clubbing together, is by mm. joining forces. Something and then like the EU, maybe. <laughs> uh, like the EU. And so when you see these incredibly... Um, powerful corporations being let off the hook by nation states fragmenting their ability to tackle uh, capital abuses. Um, uh, it's, a real, it's a real retrograde step. It's a real step in the wrong direction. Hey. Yeah, so I was on a, a very, very long train journey the other day. Do you know what I was reading? What? The Economist. Good. Have you read The Economist much? Good. It instills a level of faith in me and your intellect that you were reading The Economist. Well, The Economist is far more than just Hayden's way of testing whether you have a high IQ or not. It's about economics, it's about finance, and it covers a range of subjects. Politics, business, science, technologies, arts, even the environment. That's right. The Economist helps readers prepare for what's going on in the world. And the world is more and more confusing day by day. I'm sure our listeners will agree. So it's, it's a useful a useful tool. Yeah, I mean, say. for me... A sort of compass, a sort of political compass to guide you through the confusing events that are, are being showered in your face every day when you watch the daily and, news. And this time, we're able to offer our listeners a free copy of The Economist now when you visit theeconomist.com forward slash roast. Now... I am a really, really big fan of the writing of Miranda Johnson, who was until recently the head of their environmental coverage. She wrote a huge amount about plastics. And most sort of interesting for me was some of the work she did talking about how the petrochemical companies were actually trying to become more environmentally friendly, which might sound perverse, but actually was really, really fascinating. That's interesting. I think that's a huge issue right now. I would argue that it's more than a good read. It's a societal responsibility for us all to pay for good journalism because if we don't, it's going to disappear and then you'll regret it. And there you have it. So get involved with The Economist. We've got a fantastic deal for you. Get your free copy of The Economist now by visiting economist.com forward slash roast. Enter your details for a free copy delivered directly to your door. Well, that's interesting in relation to your first topic, talking about the EU, talking about tax, because tax is your is your background, but you've been very big on campaigning against Brexit. And perhaps you'd like to introduce your first course and tell us what you did around that, because you've become a massive figurehead of this sort of anti-Brexit campaign. So um, I spotted early on that there was... Um, a real prospect of us voting to leave, even during the referendum campaign, not through any innate brilliance, just um, watching the televised debates, you mm. could see there was a kind of, you know, many of your listeners will have spotted this themselves, you could see there was kind of a frisson of, of excitement about the leave campaign that mm. resonated with people. It and there just wasn't on the, other that, side, on yeah. the Remain yeah. side. And I watched those debates and I found them believing, of course, as I do, that Brexit's a profoundly bad idea, um, terrifying. So, of course, I hoped that what the polls were telling me was right <clears> and <throat> my own sense from those debates was wrong. But meanwhile, I was writing a lot about it. I was writing about what Brexit meant for for tax, what Brexit meant for um, big corporations being able to hold countries to account at the moment the state aid rules prevent that but if we leave the eu we'll lose the power of the state aid rules to control global capital and i was also doing some canvassing door to door then on the morning after the referendum i wrote a blog about how it was that we might end up uh, remaining notwithstanding the result and i posed two courses one would be a uh, a general election and one would be a second referendum. And those are both um, possible now. But of course, you know, if you feel strongly about something, if you're inclined to act on that strength of feeling and you're a lawyer, you do what lawyers do. You you um, you take litigate the court. shit out of it. <laughs> yeah. You take people to court. I love that on the morning of the result, he was like, right, don't like this. <laughs> Course of action one, election. Course of action two, second referendum. Uh, Makes you what deeply was your, popular. So I'm you sure. brought a case against the government, didn't you? 
Well, I've bought five or six pieces of litigation around Brexit. Hey, I can see all of them. This Jolyon, by the way, I mean, I, I can't ever claim to have like brought a case against the government. Yeah. Put a kick me sticker on the back of Ed Miliband, sure, <laughs> but it's in a really a slightly, totally different league. This, isn't it? So there's, I bought a case in Dublin, which has been my only failure so far. Um, that was to try and establish whether, if the people wanted, government could just revoke the Article 50 notification. I brought that case um, before government had even notified. So that was in the case in a sort of scenario where the you know the deal wasn't what anyone wanted. Would we be able to go back on the issuing of Article yeah. 50? So look, I mean, <clears throat> important I say this. I'm a Democrat. If I could wave a magic wand now and stop Brexit, I would not wave that wand because that's not what democracy looks like. That's not what it looks like to me. So I said at the time that I would have voted to trigger Article 50, I think it's absolutely right and important that these decisions are arrived at in a democratic way. That's absolutely where I am. But I have a lot of problems with the referendum campaign. Um, there seems to me to have been very serious, it's not so much over-promising, just kind of contradictory promises. <laughs> So if you ask, Lies. <laughs> um, if you ask Dominic Cummings um, why he didn't present, because Dominic Cummings is a strategic director of Vote Leave, the kind of official Leave campaign, you ask him why he didn't present a kind of unified vision of what leaving would mean, what Brexit would mean, he would tell you, and indeed he wrote this post before the referendum, look, there's no vision of what life looks like after Brexit around which the nation can cohere. Mm. So the trick then for us, for Vote Leave, is not to present any mm. vision of what life looks like after Brexit. And then, you know, the free marketeers can impose their kind of vision of a kind of low tax buccaneering Britain. The Lexiters can say, um, you know, we'll be able to support state industry. The disenfranchised can use it as an opportunity to kick Cameron in the bollocks. All of those people can project onto this blank mm. canvas of Brexit what they want. Mm. And uh, also speaking as a Democrat, all of those different visions of what Brexit looks like have minority support. Huh? So none of them mm. gets anything to anything like 48%. Mm. Um, it's only the very vague one that has half of the country behind it. That's right. Has or had, <clears throat> um, because of course now the opinion polls have moved. I think it's been a while since it's since an opinion poll has shown a majority in favour of leaving still. So, you know, right from the start, right from that morning after the blog, I've been focused on giving to people an opportunity to think again about the wisdom of Brexit once they know what it looks like. Hmm. Um, and so the case I brought in Ireland sought to contend that if uh, Parliament decided it wanted to revoke the notification, it could do that. And alongside those two cases, I've brought a case against the Dutch government that basically says that when we leave the EU, assuming we leave the EU, because EU citizenship is a right that we now have, the fact that the United Kingdom leaves the EU may not mean that we lose our EU citizenship. Oh, wow, so we, you're trying to make it so we can all stay in even if the country leaves right. we can all keep like we an as EU individuals passport. would keep our yeah and what would we do them. would we apply for like an eu passport would we be able how would we we'd keep our united kingdom passports but they would carry with them the rights that eu citizenship now carries so the right to live and work throughout europe fascinating um wow does that look like it might? I mean, that's that's I mean, huge. I've been desperately, literally, just literally, because my mother's side of the family is called Driscoll, and I've literally been looking for documentation. Like, Do you think my grandfather possibly did grow up in Ireland? It's like no. Do you yeah. think maybe there's a great grandfather somewhere who? So this would this is going to come to a... Estonian citizen, citizenship because <laughs> they've they've said come on yeah 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 Estonian online citizen. This is great news for lots of people who want to go and holiday in the south of France and potentially never return. I mean, this is huge. So if you won this case, that would have a huge impact on the negotiations, right? Because, well, so um, I mean, in our favour, almost in the in the UK's favour. Absolutely. So if we succeed. It would be, I think, the most important legal case in modern history. Absolutely. Um, it would give a massive extension of rights to 60 million 
people. And there is no other case um, that I can think of, at least, that has had anything like that impact. And can I ask you a question about that? Because isn't it almost a pro-Brexit case? Because if you won the big card that the EU have would would suddenly be completely redundant. You, I mean, um, they couldn't take away... I mean, that's the thing that most of us are most worried about, isn't it? Is not being able to live and work in Europe. And, well, many of us, that's a, definitely a big issue. So yeah. you'd be taking that card away from... It's, it's, from, a, it's a massive from issue. It's a massive issue for me. It's a massive issue for me as somebody who's lived in Europe. It's a massive issue for me as a parent who wants, mm. um, you know, his daughters to have that same... Privilege. But is it as big an issue as having a blue passport? No. No. You know, if you think about what you're yeah. talking about, suffrage and democratic unionism for 60 million people, and then you just look at the colour of a book, it's pretty obvious to see that, one, you hate this country, two, you hate democracy, and that you're an enemy of the people, and three, why can't you just be satisfied with a small blue book? So if the case succeeds, <clears throat> we in the United Kingdom are not reliant on the EU giving us any citizenship rights. They're not a matter of political gift, they're a matter of legal entitlement. Yeah. So it does enhance the United Kingdom's negotiating position. We do acquire a massive advantage in the negotiations, an advantage that, um, mm. that I think we, we, we actually seriously need. Is this an issue that would go in front of the European Court of Human Rights? So we argued the case in the district court in Amsterdam, we got a reference from that court a couple of weeks ago. By making a reference, um, what the court is saying that is there's a real legal arguable point here mm -hmm. that needs to be decided, so the case has merit. And then in a number of months, um, we hope in about four or five months, the Court of Justice will give its decision. Forgive the plug, but we're crowdfunding for the costs of the next leg. That's fascinating. Um, crowd justice. Well, so tell us exactly what website that is, because I'm sure there will be some of our listeners who would be avidly, you know, interested yeah. in donating. A couple of fivers, a couple of tenors. Yeah. So it's on crowdjustice.co.uk, which is the site that I use um, for most of the crowdfunding that I need to to bring these cases. And you do that with most of the cases, do you? You actually crowdfund the, the ability to do this? So the Amsterdam case, mm. um, I paid for myself the first leg because it felt to me speculative. Now I've got a reference, it's much less speculative, so I'm happy to ask other people to contribute. But all the other cases um, are crowdfunded, so I must have crowdfunded a million quid or so. You're a sort of imagine. legal gun for hire, basically. I'm it's great. I mean, it's amazing that you can that you can do that. I mean, I think it's really important to, to talk about this for a second because I remember when when we did our tax documentary, and you know we were trying to sort of prove a piece of tax legislation that was quite risky and would work to serve a point in our documentary. But a lot of the lawyers that we spoke to who weren't of your caliber were very nervous about saying anything about it. But there is something about having somebody who is in a position of being a QC that has proved themselves in, you know, in court for for, you know, essentially become a member of the establishment, a very establishment figure. There's something about having somebody like that bringing cases like this that is incredibly powerful. Mm. You know, so much of protest is in the, you know, you kind of almost set yourself up you know you're in the sort of losing position you're kind of you know you're, you're doing something you know is bound to fail but you're making a point whereas these cases have you know the government you know sits up and listens when they hear a QC is bringing them to court over a particular issue that really matters it's a big gun on the side of well, whatever side you pick whether it's you know I mean I mean further to that I think you can tell how effective you've been by the fact that the majority of the times that you appear on my timeline, it's because either Katie Hopkins or the Daily Mail or the Express or an avid Brexiteer is touting you as being someone who is tarnishing the will of the British people, which seems to inevitably now yeah. mean that you are actually doing something massively positive in this world of Orwellian well, can, can I ask you about that? Because if you are a Democrat, as you say, and you believe that the will of the people should be actioned and we should have Brexit, what is your best possible scenario? Mm. What would you like to see happen? I mean, just picking up on Gillian's point, I spoke at Conservative Party conference and I was uh, grabbed after the... Um, during the course of the conference by a conservative member of the Brexit 
Select Committee, who <laughs> gave me a real bollocking. Wow. Um, in a small a room of only about a dozen people, you know, quite a high powered room. There was a, a cabinet, uh, sorry, there was a minister there, another Brexit minister, um, gave me a real bollocking for my unpatriotic activities around Brexit. And, and, um, I didn't say anything. I I smiled though because I thought, you know, there's no greater badge of success than your opponents mm. telling you um, that you're getting in their way. Totally. Um, and um, sorry, I'd not forgotten your question. Well, I was just going to ask that if you know if you do think we need to leave and we need to honour the vote, the referendum. What is your best possible scenario? What would you like to see happen? I'd love to hear not just what you'd like to see happen, but what you do mm. think will happen between now and the nineteenth of March, twenty nineteen. There's really only one question. I think you know we endlessly hypothesise about worlds in which Brexit might or might not happen, but fundamentally it all comes down to what the popular mood is, um, it seems to me. If we get to sort of 60, 40, remain, leave, then the Labour Party will find a way to vote against the deal uh, and there will be enough Conservative remain supporting MPs for that vote to carry the House. And then the Article 50 notification, I think, could very well be withdrawn so fundamentally, at the end of the day, um, it's about what the people come to want, or at least what the opinion polls show the people come to want. And that's as it should be, of course. So if, if the deal is voted against, what happens then? Is there, is there another referendum or is, it, is an election called? Well, there's a, there's a kind of a, a funny dynamic here because politicians aren't at the moment terribly courageous and... They... And that's to put it mildly, isn't it? I mean, leadership in terms of its quality seems to have been utterly abandoned. Nick Clegg made some very, very good points when he was speaking to James O'Brien recently about how, you know, love him or loathe him, that, that even 10 years ago, five years ago, that was seen as necessary to lead with unpopular decisions. And now that term that you just mentioned, will of the people, has sort of almost become synonymous with, well, we're just going to barrel on regardless. Well, they're interested in the will of the people, aren't they, at a particular moment in time? They're mm. not really interested in the will of the people now, mm. because if you are interested in the will of the people now, then you stay in the single market and you stay in the customs union and you possibly even revoke Article 50. So, you know, you need to unpack this carefully. So I have some sympathy with the Labour Party's position, because although it's all very well for a party to talk about shifting the Overton window in relation to a political issue that hasn't been the subject of a referendum campaign and indeed a referendum vote, it seems to me to be rather different when there has been a referendum for a party, particularly um, the government or indeed Majesty's opposition, to campaign against the outcome of a referendum. That does make me feel a bit uncomfortable. So I understand why Labour is where it is presently on that question whether we should continue to plan to leave or whether we should remain. But I don't understand where Labour is on questions like whether we should stay in the single market or whether we should stay in the customs union, why it's silent on what shape of Brexit we should have. So none of the votes that have been in Parliament that seek to shape uh, the nature of the deal that the government does with the EU have been passed. And they haven't really been passed because they haven't really been supported by the Labour Party. Isn't that because, I mean, isn't it actually quite a smart position to be in because there is no answer? So, you know, the vaguer you can be, the better. And Well, and that's, that's really, um, that's really Julian's question. So is it the Labour Party's job at the moment just to sit back and look to take political advantage from the mm. situation for itself? Or does the Labour Party have some obligation to provide leadership, to offer some kind of governance in a world in which the Conservative Party is hopelessly split and the country is being dragged in um, what seems to me at least to be an enormously damaging mm. direction. The difficulty that Dominic Cummings created um, way back in 2015 when he made that decision not to present a picture of what the world would look like after Brexit is not a difficulty that we have resolved, 
it's still the problem that prevents the Conservative Party from forming a view about what Brexit means. And the Labour Party really should have a role in that. And, it, and it's abandoning that role. Isn't this kind, of, this kind of conversation that we're having now, isn't it in danger, though, of repeating sort of all of the problems that the Remain campaign faced in the first place and the Leave campaign took advantage of, which is, on the one hand, an incredibly emotive argument playing to, you know, nationalistic fears and, you know, discuss the immigration and this sort of Second World War war image of you know the white cliffs of dover and britain standing alone like john lloyd who i've got a lot of respect for said to me recently that he'd read a poll where 75 percent of leavers accept that we'll be economically worse off but would just do it again you know and I, I sort of wonder whether is there a kind of anything that you've tapped into in your time that is much more of an emotive argument that the remain campaign could make that has nothing to do with economics um I think that's a really, really good question. I mean, there, there are some problems with John Lloyd's numbers, but let's let's not let's not talk about those. So I read what Churchill said about Europe. I read what Thatcher said about Europe. I read speeches from other leading conservatives and indeed from Blair on Europe, looking for that point of emotional resonance. Mm. Um, and it's possible, I think, to find an argument that resonates with some constituencies. So having spent myself a year in Europe as an Erasmus student, drinking with and socialising with and as often as I could sleeping with um, <laughs> uh, uh, fellow Europeans. So for people like me, you know, we do feel kind of intensely European. Mm. And there is a sense of a part of our identity being... Um, taken away from us. What have you brought us for our main, Julian? So, um, leaving Brexit behind, one of the most interesting cases I'm doing is a case against Uber and against HMRC. So, Ooh. I reckon that Uber has avoided about a billion pounds of VAT... Uh, not much then. Uh, not much. Yeah. And I'm very, very frustrated that HMRC isn't doing anything about it. Yeah. And so um, I've found a little trick that enables me to act as HMRC. Amazing. How? Like a kind of cheat in a computer game where you can suddenly be the boss. Absolutely like a cheat in a computer I game. I love it. So... Um, you just prank calling them? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm HMRC. Hello. <laughs> Your return is, is really, really overdue. <laughs> So if you receive a, a taxable supply, you're entitled to a VAT invoice. You're going to have to break this down into really simple terms that <laughs> an idiot like I'm, me I'm, can I'm, understand. I'm doing that, Julian. Do you mean I'll like a, some... an email from Uber when you have a receipt? Is that what you mean? So if you're me, you reckon that Uber is supplying transportation services. So Uber says, no, no, we're just an agent. It's the drivers who are yeah. supplying We're oh, just oh, an yes. app. We're a tech company. We're a tech company. We're yeah. an app. We're, we're not really doing anything. All our drivers are freelance. Do you know um, how I know that's not true? How come they see the little computer cars on the map then, if that's not their cars? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I've seen it on the screen many times. We will call you as an expert in Australia. <laughs> I knew it. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> so basically the case is that Uber is the transportation supplier. That's why when you go on their website, they talk about taking an Uber. And the drivers are working for Uber. And I reckon that HMRC should be taking that point and saying you, Uber, should be charging VAT. And if you've been charging VAT for the last four years, you would owe us uh, about £200 million, a little bit over £200 million for each of those years, plus interest. So a very, very substantial amount of money. But HMRC aren't interested, and I'll talk about why that is. But what I found was that um, there's a little bit of a tax code that says that if you take an Uber and that Uber is taxable, that taxi service is taxable because it's supplied by Uber, you're entitled to have a VAT receipt from Uber. Oh. Um, so I sued Uber in the High Court, demanding that they provide me with a copy of the VAT receipt. Now, <laughs> they can't settle that case because they can't give me a VAT receipt, because if they give me a VAT right. receipt, they're, they're accepting that all of their taxi fares, all of their taxis are transportation services supplied by them and so they should be charging that and sending it to HMRC. So can I just check how this works? Are you saying that they are char obviously Uber's charging uh, VAT on every ride that you take on top of the fare? That's what I say. 
but were their employees PAYE? Were were they were, if they had all their drivers, uh, you know, being paid on a monthly basis on a PAYE scheme? They would have to pay VAT for all those drivers, but they're not because they're freelance. Is that so? There's a couple of there's a case um, that a group of drivers won in the employment tribunal, and they won it in the upper tribunal as well, the employment appeal tribunal, in which they said that they were Uber's workers. And what being Uber's workers means relevantly for my case is that they are supplying their services as drivers to Uber. Mm. Now, if they're supplying their services as drivers to Uber, mm. it follows that they can't be supplying their services as drivers to me. So right. then the question is, well, who's supplying the services, the taxi services, to me? And the employment tribunal said, well, the answer is obvious. It's it's Uber. Right. So to answer your question, Ed, it, it, it doesn't matter whether they're on Uber's payroll. They yeah. have to be PAYE. They just have to be supplying their services to to Uber rather than to me. And there are now a number of cases in the United Kingdom, in Europe, uh, and in the States, all of which have suggested that the proper analysis is that the drivers are supplying services to Uber. And Uber is not a tech company. It is a transportation mm. company. It is So when you hear their chief exec on the radio talking about how they're going to have this kind of integrated transport system where you get off your taxi and you get onto a bus that will be run by Uber and the bus will take you to the airport and you get on a But we're plane. not a transport company. We're not a <laughs> transport company. No, no, no. So this seems to have huge implications for the whole gig economy because obviously um, this particular loophole is not just exploited by one company but by a whole gamut of companies that seem to now look at these uh, you know quote unquote uh, self-employed people who work alongside them as as completely different what are the potential ramifications if this court case does come the way you think it's going to so go? let me um, get right to the heart of it a lot of these tech companies um, do deliver real economic efficiencies. So they give us something that we don't have. It's something that's valuable to customers. It's something that's valuable to workers as well. So that's the good thing they do. The bad thing very often that they do is they are basically engaging in a kind of arbitrage. They see a weakness in the system. They sit on that weakness. And that weakness enables them to make kind of super big profits that they're not really entitled to because they're they're good they're entitled to them just because they're engaging in this kind of regulatory arbitrage and in order to do that they have to do two contradictory things at the same time they have to pretend to be what lawyers call intermediators so they have mm. to pretend to sit between the customer and the service provider without being one or the other themselves but they also have to curate the customer experience, control the customer experience sufficiently that the customer keeps coming back. So, you know, it has to be a kind of a uniform service. And those two things are in profound tension with one another. They can't really do them both at the same time. And one of the important things that I hope this case will do is expose that tension you know, I love all of the efficiencies that the internet has delivered to us. I want to continue to enjoy them. They're incredibly valuable for those who need to be able to work flexibly. But I don't want them to be parasites. I don't want them to drive out employment mm. rights for people who have no bargaining power. I don't want them to drive out companies who are paying their proper share of tax. I want them to be good participants in society. So just to take the sort of contrarian point of view here, a lot of economists would argue that these disruptive technologies are a perfectly valid, opportunistic key to free market capitalism, that a sort of a, a loophole was found and deeply exploited. How, how would you sort of argue that case? Well, I'd, I'd agree with them. So economic advantages are, are good. But when people basically arbitrage weaknesses in the tax system or the labor market in order to drive out the, the good operators, that's bad. So let me give you a very simple example. Ubers basically operate like black cabs, right? If you are a black cab, you have to have disabled access to your cabs. So you have to have that little platform that comes down. We impose that obligation on black cabs because we think that it is important. If you allow Ubers to operate like black cabs, 
but without the obligation to have that disabled access, what you're doing is you're undercutting the achievement of that public purpose mm. of facilitating disabled access to cabs because the Ubers don't have to have that technology, so they're much cheaper, and therefore the black cabs get driven out of the market. Did and minicabs that, that, ever that, have to that's have that? Thwarted. Mini cabs uh, don't, but mini cabs are different from black cabs because mini cabs can't tout for for trade. Mm. Ubers meaningfully operate just like black cabs; they patrol the streets, and so um, you pick one up just as easily, sometimes more easily than you pick up a black cab. Mm. Taxis are in a slightly different market. Mm. So the point that I'm making is, we have to work out as a society what we want to achieve. What are these objectives that we want? And if one of them is disabled access, then then we have to protect that. And once we've done that, we have to secure that those objectives are not undercut. And I gave disabled access as an example, but it could be protection of labor. It could be paying the right amount of tax. Bigger, just more complicated examples to explain. I want to make sure that we actually wind this up by actually answering the question that we posed at the beginning, which is, you know, personally, I find it incredibly worrying when I read stuff about HMRC spending an awful lot of money chasing benefit claimants than tax avoiding companies. And in this case, you say that the HMRC aren't pursuing Uber, but they really could. Why are HMRC not doing that? HMRC, so I, I got a, I published a recording uh, a couple of weeks ago of a very, very senior HMRC official saying, um, first time ever, uh, saying that they were lent on by Treasury. Uh. Um, Go easy on Amazon, this very senior HMRC official said. And my view is that Treasury, uh, which is very, very political, thinks that it would be a good idea if the United Kingdom looked like a kind of favorable environment for these big tech companies to come and invest in, and if the cost is that uh, we don't collect from these big tech companies, the tax that we should, that's a cost that it's in the national interest to pay. Mm. I think that's Treasury's thinking. I think that's why they put pressure on HMRC. I believe they do put pressure on HMRC. What I think that analysis ignores is the cost, not the economic cost, although that's very serious, but the social cost. So when people in Stoke or Sunderland see uh, wealthy Uber execs swanking into 11 Downing Street to talk to Osborne and um, they see Uber not paying its tax. They are angry. They they lose trust in democracy. They think that there is one rule for the privileged class and there's another rule for them. And they're right to be angry. And so, you know, bringing those two themes together, one of the reasons why I do the stuff about tax and I'm doing a whole slew of other cases in housing and employment as well is because I want to give voice to those legitimate concerns, mm. very legitimate concerns mm. about for who the country is run. It is not run for the people, it should be run for the people. Well, look, that is absolutely fascinating stuff. We don't have long left, but you mentioned housing briefly there. Do you want to talk about your dessert? I'm now looking at another area that concerns lots and lots of people, which is which is housing. And in particular, you know, one of the things that happens when you have a market that is loaded too heavily in favour of one of the market participants here, landlords, is that you get abuses. And one really powerful and prevalent abuse is landlords providing accommodation that falls below a kind of an acceptable standard. Mm -hmm. So accommodation that is damp, um, that is mouldy, that is pest infested, that is not properly maintained, that's cold, that's drafty, that's bad for your health, bad for your children's health, bad for your parents' health. And that accommodation tends to get dumped on the most vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. And in the United Kingdom at the moment, the most vulnerable people, kind of all but friendless, are asylum seekers. And what happens is that government has to provide a accommodation for asylum seekers and it subcontracts that obligation out to these great mm. big outsourcing companies who provide you know rat infested moldy accommodation to people who are come from you know God. terrible countries trying to raise their children um, and all of the laws that exist to protect the quality of housing are ignored and no one cares government doesn't care the mood in the country um, abysmally I think is very, very antipathetic towards immigrants. And so we just don't care how badly they are treated. And so the case that I'm looking at with a couple of other lawyers is this. 
it's a criminal offence actually to provide housing below a certain standard and so what I'm trying to do is bring a private prosecution of one of these big suppliers um, for government of really poor quality housing to asylum seekers a criminal prosecution um, because it will get people's attention you know if you're a an exec for one of these big outsourcing companies and you're fined what do you care really it's a drop in the bucket your shareholders will pay the costs but if there's a criminal record attached to your name mm. um, that's gonna that's gonna get your attention mm. so it's powerful in terms of achieving social change it's also terrific in campaigning terms mm. because we all you know a regulatory fine meh who cares someone's gonna face a criminal prosecution now nah, that gets people's attention and how is that when are you bring that so at the moment i'm in relatively early stages i'm having a series of meetings with housing lawyers over the next few days because presumably you have to you're not an expert in every area of law so you have to bring in people specific to to any area that you decide to bring litigation so what i try and do is i try and identify interesting points and think about how they might be litigated Mm. and then i find the lawyers who tell me whether or not those points are runners and then once i've found the lawyers if they say they're runners I look for funding to bring those cases. And is this a crowdfunded thing as well? Can so this, people, would be, where can people... this would be crowdfunded. So we would need expert evidence, yeah. as it were, about the quality of housing and about it being below yeah. the, the acceptable standard. And we'd need to gather quite a lot of evidence. Can I ask, um, for people maybe who don't know that much about this, how widespread, how, how prevalent is this problem? Can you give us a sense of sort of the scale of it, the numbers involved? Well, all these different types of abuses of housing law are not, to the best of my knowledge, aggregated together. And there are lots and lots of different types of abuses. So there's this abuse, which I suspect will affect tens of thousands of people. Mm. There's another thing that's happening, particularly in London, where landlords are buying houses and converting them without planning permission into microflats, and they then milking housing benefits. So the cap for a house for housing benefit is you know, nominally 100. But if you break it up into eight micro flats without planning permission, and the local authority will pay you eight times 50. And so you can buy these houses, you get a kind of massive guaranteed income, um, because you're breaking the planning laws. Um, and the victims are us who pay our taxes and have to fund these enormous housing benefit bills for substandard accommodation and the families who are living in accommodation yeah. uh, that is just not fit for I went. I went to see a place with a friend of mine when they were trying to buy a house in Walthamstow in East London, and the two top bedrooms had been broken up into three rooms with kind of cardboard mishmash of kind of like semi-permanent cement, plastic boarding, and it was exactly as you described, you know, super damp, rot everywhere. And in one of the small compartments was a woman living apparently with a small child on housing benefit. And when I started started asking, you know, how this was possible, they just looked at me like, you know, are you crazy? This happens all the time. And it was one of those moments where you just feel incredibly ignorant. So I consider myself somebody, you know, some basic understanding of these issues but this is this is happening an awful lot isn't it it's it's a really 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 big problem so i'm trying to get together a group of people to talk about that as well and you know we hear an awful lot of splendid rhetoric don't we about equality of of opportunity about a an equal society but if you uh, if you don't have somewhere you can sleep at night if there's um, a drug addict living on the other side of a cardboard wall from the room in which you're trying to raise your your two children, then it really is a it's a it's a kind of a hollow and broken promise. Absolutely, Julian. Thank you so so much for coming on News Roast, and I hope you know in in, in the months and years to come you'll come back and you know yeah. tell us how these things are proceeding. And follow Julian on Twitter so you can keep up with his various legal cases against the government and the powers that be. What, what, you're just Julian Morm. Julian Morm. Yeah, M A U G H A M. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, follow Julian. Fund his new campaigns. I love it. It's the you're a sort of legal gun for hire going out and uh, 
and fighting the good fight in in the courts and people can maybe this is the new the new protest but it's not really like a gun for hire is it it's more like a sort of crowdfunding legal superman just yeah. going after the like baddies a, like a legal ninja like a kind like of a ninja assassin like a robin hood who's taking from the yeah kind of relatively well-off crowdfunding way and giving to the poor. <laughs> yeah. It's great. But listen, yeah. thank you so, so much. And, you know, I hope you'll you'll come back and see us soon. Guys, this is a good example of, you know, a news roast that we really would not be able to bring to you uh, without you subscribing to the podcast, sharing it with your friends. And hopefully you've learned something that I, I know I certainly have. So please, please, please subscribe. Rate the podcast out of five uh, because it is the advertisers who, who are actually paying uh, for this podcast to exist. So thank you very much. Uh, and we will see you soon.